so the Void on one. Uh, it plays these control cards along with cards like Baleful Strix, and then has Tezzeret as a Haymaker finisher for the deck. Okay, great. Now, Mike, on the other hand, he's to the left of your screen. He's playing a Blue-White Stoneblade deck. Uh, he's playing Stoneforge Mystic. He's playing Vidalian Click, True Name Nemesis. As his creature base, of course, he has Jason the Mind Sculptor, Batter Skull, Jitte. Um, regardless, they are off to the races here. Yeah. Mike actually mulliganed out the six, and it looks like Ari's going to try to go for a uh, Chalice of the Void on one. Yeah, we're going to see that start here, which you're talking about, one of these really powerful plays. Uh, Ari does get, and it actually, it, we're going to see if it sticks right now. Mike started on a Scalding Tarn. Yeah, now essentially what Chalice will do if it resolves uh, will prevent Mike from playing Ponder, it will prevent him from playing Brainstorm, Spell Pierce, Swords to Plowshare, and whatnot. So normally in Legacy, a lot of players will have a lot of one-drops in their deck. On the other hand, Ari doesn't have many one-drops in his deck. That's why Chalice the Void is very good. At this point, does Mike know what, decks Ari, what deck Ari is on, or are there a lot of decks that play Tomb into Chalice? Yeah, I mean, he, he doesn't know right now. Okay. Yeah, he, he might have some idea, but uh, he doesn't know for sure that Ari is playing a blue-black Tezzeret-type deck. So it looks like that Chalice is going to stick. Mike right. will draw for his turn. He has a pretty land-heavy hand. It looks like he has a pair of Mishra's Factories. He has the Stoneforge Mystic, which he's going to make this turn. And he has some support in Vendillion Click and Counterspell. Yeah, actual Counterspell. So he's not playing any, uh, you know, the countertop combo. He's not playing Counterbalance. He's not playing Sensei's Dividing Top. Uh, instead, he just opts for actual Counterspell. Yeah, interestingly, Mike's hand has no one-drops in it. Yep. Uh, the Stoneforge Mystic is going to get Force of Willed by Ari. He pitched a Thirst for Knowledge for it. Exactly. So Ari will now untap. He'll draw for his turn. The Ancient Tomb will allow him to... Uh, uh, you know, continue to ramp his mana. Although he will take two damage every time he taps that Agent Tomb for mana, in this matchup it doesn't matter that much. Yeah, Ari's just going to continue to develop his mana. He played a Polluted Delta there. Now, I'm, I want to go back to that Chalice for one. How much of a pain is that for Mike here? It looks like his deck doesn't play too many ones. Well, it actually it does. It, ju it just works out that Mike just doesn't have any ones in his hand. Uh, he does have four Brainstorms. He does have four Ponders. He has three Spell Pierce, and he has four Swords to Plowshare. So, you know, Chalice for one is pretty bad because it stops all of Mike's card draw besides for Jason the Mind Sculptor, and if you want to count Stoneforge Mystic as a card draw spell. Yeah, and then he, he doesn't have a way to get it off the table either. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for, for game one, he has no way to remove that Chalice of the Void. All right, so we see both players just developing their mana. Ari played a fourth land and passed, but then an end step Vendillion click happened. Uh, once it did resolve, but Mike targeted himself to get rid of a spell pierce. Okay, yeah, and I mean, that would be nice, but he actually just drew a ponder, so. Yeah, he <laughs> turned another, one into another. Yeah, another dead card. Uh, so after board, Mike is definitely going to bring in the, uh, the couple of detention spheres that he has, so he's able to get around the chalice void and, and actually remove it. Yeah, so we see an activation on Factory and a swing here for five from Mike. There's a little bit of a tell here that he has Counterspell because he didn't use the Factory to pump the Factory, right? Sure, I mean, that, that's one way to look at it. Uh, I, I don't know if, if Ari's really thinking about Counterspell. Counterspell is only a one of in Mike's deck. Uh, I think Counterspell is a good card. Uh, I also think Mana Leak's a good card, although nobody really plays Mana Leak because they either go for Counterspell or they go for Spell Pierce. But Mana right. Leak's somewhere in the middle, and you know, lots of decks do play Wasteland. They have a lot of colorless land, so playing Mana Leak isn't the worst thing. No, Mana Leak's fine. It's yeah, a lot of Mana Leak and Counterspell are very similar cards. Sure. Yeah, especially in Legacy when you know everyone's tight on their mana already, having to right. pay an additional three. Even something like Rune Snag could maybe one day make their their way into Legacy. Who knows? So we do see here, uh, Ari's down to 10. He's on a two-turn clock. Mike's hand is Counterspell, Ponder, Ponder. So it really is just Counterspell. But on Ari's side, he doesn't have much many control elements. We see him play this Talisman here just to continue ramping his mana. And then he has one other card in his hand. It's a blue one. Yeah, um, can't make it out quite yet. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what... it's Transmute Artifact. Okay, is that what it is? Yeah. All right, so let's see if Ari's going to go for it right here, and I think he will. So uh, there it is. let is. Uh, I'm pretty yeah. sure Mike's going to counter this. Run us through. How does this work, though? Well, what, essentially what I think is going to happen is that I think Mike's just going to counterspell this Transmute Artifact uh, and then untap, swing Ari down to one... I can't really see Mike letting this resolve here. Yeah, well, what would it transmute into if he does let it resolve? So this is something he sacks an artifact. Well, why don't you tell us exactly what it does? It's a transmute artifact. Uh, it's a sorcery that sacks an artifact. If you do, you can search your library for an artifact with mana cost le less than or equal to the same, and then put it into play. You can also get a bigger one if you're willing to pay the difference. Sure, exactly. Now, uh, Mike did end up counterspelling it. 
he draws a batter skull but batter skull can't come down quite yet and mike doesn't even want to cast batter skull he just wants to swing in for seven if ari goes to one Ari's essentially drawing dead or close to dead. Yeah, well, he can't tap that Ancient Tomb anymore. Yeah, I mean, the only card that Ari could really save and the card that he was going to fetch up uh, was probably a Snaring Bridge to, to, you know, stop the attack. Right. Uh, uh, he drew a Jace, the Mind Sculptor. It's a great card here, but no help. Mike Wurzer will take down game one. Yeah, I think Ari's only out there was either having that... Um, uh, Resolve or having him top deck the Snaring Bridge. Interestingly, uh, because Transmute Artifact is an older card, uh, the Sacrificing Artifact half of it does, is not part of the cost. It happens during the resolution of the spell. So when it was counterspelled there, that's why Ari didn't lose an Artifact. Exactly, yeah. It came out way before Tinker, Transmute Artifact. Uh, so you could have Transmute Artifact for the Snaring Bridge. He does play one copy of the Snaring Bridge. And like we said before, Mike just doesn't have any answers main deck to, to a permanent like Chalice or Snaring Bridge. Right, so in a sense, Ari's trying to lock out the game here. He seems like, right, when he's playing card like Ensnaring Bridge or yeah, I mean, Chalice he, of the Void. Yeah, he's trying to lock it out, but Mike still could win with a Jace the Mind Sculptor. He could just ultimate Jace the Mind Sculptor uh, and win that way. Uh, so they're going to go to the sideboard right now. Uh, taking a look at Ari's sideboard, did, do you think he has anything that he really wants here? Uh, because looking at Mike's sideboard, Mike has a couple of cards that he definitely wants. He definitely wants the Tension Spheres here. He definitely wants the uh, extra Vidalian Click. And I'm almost certain he would rather have Sword of Feast of Famine over something like, le uh, let's say, uh, Umazawa's Jitte. Yeah, so he can definitely upgrade some of his equipment. Ari's side is a little harder to say. He does have Duresses, which are pretty good in this matchup. Okay. Um, outside of that, he has extra ensnaring bridges if he wants them. Um, he has cards like Trinisphere and Lodestone Golem. I don't know how good they are in this matchup, though. Sure, sure. That, that's definitely understandable. Uh, Swan Song is another card that Mike might, might want to consider bringing in here. Uh, he's, he's able to counter a, um, you know, in a very important sorcery, uh, something, uh, you know, an instant, or, or, or just pretty much anything in general or here. Or Tezzeret. Yeah. Yeah, so that could... So it seems like Mike has more options available to him. Um, well, the Swan Song can't get the Tezzeret. So uh, okay. uh, Swan Song is only enchantment. Enchantment. Uh, yeah, enchantment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instant enchantment sorcery. Instant sorcery. Exactly. Yeah. So, but but giving or uh, Ari the uh, the two two flying bird token won't really matter at all. No. But I I could see him bringing that in. Um, so we'll uh, we'll see what happens. It, it, it's a nice answer to to say like Ari's Force Will, just a one mana. It's it's the kind of additional spell pierces the way it might work out in this matchup. Uh, regardless, Ari now will be on the play. Uh, I think Ari being on the play will help a little bit, but yeah. I think with Mike's sideboard, I think Mike is probably favored in this matchup. Well, we did see Ari do a lot of things that he wanted to in the matchup by sticking that early chalice, chalice and it, it really didn't hurt Mike very much. He was able to just kind of play right through it. Yeah, and, and that's the beauty of, like, a blue white. Like, normally you don't see many blue white stone blade decks. There's normally, like, Esper, uh, Esper stone blade or, like, uh, Esper death blade with death right shamans. Uh, here it's just straight blue white. And, uh, you know, he, he could go aggressive with Stoneforge Mystic over Dallion Click or True Name Nemesis, or he could go more controlling with Jace the Mind Sculptor and Supreme Verdict. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll see how both players uh, sideboard, and uh, hopefully, you know, they both have pretty good draws, and we can see a nice match here. Now, if you were to, uh, to you know to get out of the booth right now, hop in the tournament, and knowing you know what people are playing, would you try to meta game, or would you maybe just stick to a deck that you're more comfortable with? Well, I think in legacy, comfort level is very important. There's a lot of a lot of. Uh, uh, you have to know your own deck very well. You also sure. have to know your opponent's decks very well, because I think the decks are doing so many different things. I think knowing the matchups is probably more important in Legacy than it is in other formats. There's just so many different matchups to be able to play. So I'd probably play something in my comfort level. I, I don't think... It's not. A, it takes a lot, a lot of practice with your metagame deck, I think, to get equal value out of it. Yeah. Now remember, today we're playing nine rounds of Legacy, and we're going to do the top eight, top four, and the finals all today. Yesterday we saw Matt Costa win with uh, his Jun Standard deck. So I think the new standard card on the rise is going to be Reaper of the Wilds. I've been walking around Reaper of the Wilds. I think is only like a two dollar card right now. Yeah, we may see it go up after you you're might see down it go up. Yeah. SCG Open. Yeah, a lot of Reaper of the Wilds out there. The card is very good. Yeah, he that card. Certainly had a little bit of a coming out in the top eight here. We saw we saw it in a couple other decks, I believe. Yeah, it's Junk. Junk also bug. playing it. Bug playing it. Um, all these mid-range decks that are just starting to emerge are all running Reaper of the Wilds. Yeah, going Sylvan Carroted into uh, Reaper of the Wilds is just very, very good against any of the aggro decks. And Reaper of the Wild is also good against the control decks because you could give it Hexproof. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You know, you can stop a hero's downfall. You can stop an Azorius charm. Uh, obviously, it, 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 it's also good when you have other creatures in play, and, you know, those creatures die, you're able to scry and kind of dig deeper into your deck. My, uh, my friend Eric actually played Reaper of the Wilds, and he ended up uh, forgetting the trigger, he said, about 60% of the time. <laughs> well, the card, that's one of the harder parts with the card. There's, you have to make sure you hit all your, hit, remember your triggers on it, which it is an easy card to miss triggers for. Yeah, exactly. All right. So Blueback Tezzeret's a deck you, you, you don't really see too much of in Legacy. Um, a friend of mine, Josh Martinez, he's a big fan of Blueback Tezzeret. Uh, but for the most part, it's like you really have to have a passion for Tezzeret to play Tezzeret in Legacy, I think. We have seen Caleb Durward win an SCG Open with yeah, Tezzeret Yeah, he's before. another one. You could, you could also play Blueback Tezzeret in, like, the Affinity Shell. That's the other option here. Uh, Ari is playing a, a slightly different version of Blueback Tezzeret. Uh, so uh, we'll see how this plays out for him. He is 2-1, and one, so one more loss. He's, he's most likely out of this tournament. So we'll see. We see uh, a couple of lands, a Balfour Strix, I believe, Force of Will. Seems like Ari's hand's pretty good. Unfortunately, Mike's going to have to mulligan. Yeah, Mike's hand was very short on land there. was not uh, much of a debatable feature. Okay. Now, do you think Mike's actually considering something like, say if his hand was one land with a Brainstorm Ponder, would he kind of think back to game one and say, hey, I remember Ari just played turn one, Chalice, and one. If I keep this hand, I'm going to auto-lose. Or do you think he doesn't really put that into consideration? Like, do players think back to the first game or the previous game or even the previous round? I mean, at least he knows the play exists, so he has to be a little hesitant to keep that kind of hand. Um, so, yeah, I would say that that sort of thing does affect what mulligans you can keep. You don't want to let it determine your play completely because sometimes, you know, sometimes a, a handful of a lot of one drops, like the one you described, maybe that's just how your deck works. And that's how your deck works. You just have to kind of acknowledge that your deck is cold, just or is very weak to starts like turn one, Ancient Tomb into Chalice. Yeah, I remember I lost the finals of a Moto PTQ. I was up a game, uh, and then game two, he played like three Frogmites against me. And for game three, I boarded a Meddling Mage and I named Frogmite. And then he just played like Archman Ravager and I lost, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I, I pretty much deserve to lose that one. All right, so we do see turn one, both players just exchanging land drops. Mike's hand looks pretty reactive here. He has some Force of Wills, a Spell Pierce, and lands. I mean, his hand is good. This is what he wants. This is, this is a good uh, hand for him. If the game just goes like draw, go, draw, go, I think it favors Mike. Definitely. I think Ari really wants to, you know, bust out a fast Tezzeret or, you know, bust out a Chalice into a Tezzeret. So both players are continuing just to trade lands. Mike did make a Caracas here. I don't know how much... I don't know if we have any legendary creatures going on right now. Yeah, all right. So Ari's going to go for a uh, Duress, and Mike just has to let this resolve. Yeah, so we're going to see his hand. It looks like it's a pair of Force Wills, a pair of Spell Pierces. And uh, everything's secretive to us. You know, Sword of Feast and Famine. They don't want us to see. And we'll... This is rude. You, and you know, land. Ari... Is, and a Tundra. Uh, Ari, uh, I don't like how Ari's playing. Again, it's laid on the yeah. table for us. Come on, everybody at home wants to see. All right. Um, so all right. Pierce, Pierce, Force, Force, Tundra, Sword. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure Ari's probably going to take like either a Force or a Spell Pierce here. I, I can't really see him taking the Sword. Most likely Force, but maybe Spell Pierce. I mean, because if he does take Force, it's like Mike doesn't have to two-for-one himself again. Right, I think maybe, maybe it depends how much mana Ari has in his hand, too. Exactly. He did take a Spell Pierce. Yeah. All and right. now he's going to crack all his fetch lands presumably for another play. Yeah, all right. So he gets two Underground Seas. And uh, I'm not sure what he has here. Maybe just, uh, you know, something to, to, to ramp him. Yeah, it might just be a Mana Rock or something. He's going to try oh, for Balfour Strix. Okay, yeah, so it was the Balfour Strix that he had in his opening hand. That makes yeah, sense. He knows that all that Mike could do is Force of Will this. Exactly. And I think he's more than happy if Mike decides to Force of Will it. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure Mike's not going to Force of Will it, and he doesn't. All right, so pass back. Ari does have a couple of pieces in his hand to his deck. He has the Tezzeret Asian of Bullets. He yeah. also has a Thopter Foundry in his hand. Okay, so Mike draws up a Delian Click. Uh, unfortunately, he's not going to be able to cast it, so he's going to have to cast a sword instead. Uh, he yeah. can't cast it because of that Caracas, essentially. Yeah, that, that card I thought was Tundra was actually just a regular plane. Yeah, so it was he's just only a plane. Yeah. Single blue. Exactly. Uh, so Ari will swing it for one. What do you think Ari might follow up with this? Another Strix here? Well, let's find out. Uh, he does. He's going to go ahead and go for Thopter Foundry. It looks like he wants to resolve that while Mike's tapped does not have Spell Pierce mana up. That makes sense. And so Mike's forced to spend his Force of Will on Thopter Foundry. And if you look at all the cards in Ari's hand, you'd say he's pretty happy to get the Force targeting a Thopter Foundry. Yeah, because, I mean, he has Jace in his hand too, correct? Jace yes, and Tezzeret. Jace and Tezzeret. Yeah. 
So if Jace or Tezzeret comes out on, on this current board, Ari's going to be in great shape. Yeah, no land for Mike. He passes back the turn. Ari's going to try for another Thopter Foundry. There's another Forcible in Mike's hand, and it looks like it's going to get it. So Mike's Forcible is a second time, this time removing that Vendillion click, and he's left with just Batter Skull. Yeah, Mike's going to have to get a lot of really good draws here. I mean, that's just start with an island. At least he could draw another land and play Batter Skull, or he could just top deck something like a Jace. Uh, yeah. There's that second blue source. It's the fourth land for Mike. Ari still can't hit land for, but he's going to dig with it toward it with Baleful Strix. Oh, and he does draw a Jace. What an excellent draw. Wow, and that's pretty relevant right now. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, Ari, Ari has a Force of Will. Yeah. And, and, and by him doing this, it's kind of signifying that he has multiple blue spells in his hand, which doesn't matter that much, but it's normally better yeah. just to do everything at once. Yeah, he has Force Pissing Jace, Force Pitching Tetherite, and Force Pissing Pitching Force. He went for Force Pitching Jace. That's always a scary signing to your opponent pitching a Jace to a Force of Will on this board. Yep, exactly. All right, so Ari draws for the turn. Yep, he's going to go ahead and go for a Talisman. So now he will have his fourth mana next turn. He's going to continue to beat in with these Baleful Strixes. Uh, he also drew Sword of the Meek this turn. Uh, but he plays Ratchet Bomb instead, which is fine here. Yeah, is there a specific permanent he's looking to answer with Ratchet Bomb? Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not necessarily, I would say, but just getting Ratchet Bomb out there, maybe he's going to follow up with Tezzeret and turn that Ratchet Bomb into an attacker next turn. Okay. That's probably more likely. You know, bashing for seven, attack with sure. the Strixes, attack with the, uh, the the newly found five five Ratchet Bomb. All right. Well, Mike's gonna play Vendillion Click, and we has a forceable right okay. there. Yeah, oh, he, he just wanted to stop it. it was yeah. Force. Yeah, it was force pitching, pitching Tezzeret. Yeah, pitching the Tezzeret. Yeah. So now Ari doesn't have any of his Planeswalkers left. He's pitched both. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, we'll uh, we'll see what Ari draws here. He has a sort of the Meek in hand. Yeah, um, I'm. I suppose he pitches, is it better to, he pitches the Tezzeret there because he assumes the V-Click's going to take it, right? Uh, I'm not too sure what Ari's game plan is. He's got Demir Signet and Sword of the Meat. Yeah, I was kind of just thinking, like, that Vidalian Click, I mean, I guess the whole thing is that Ari thinks it's just, like, too, his Ratchet Bomb is too slow because, sure, the Vidalian Click will get a hit in with the Sword, but that Ratchet Bomb will go up to three, right? And will take out yeah. the Sword and the Vidalian Click. My worry here is that if my, so... If Mike gets that fifth land, Ari actually doesn't have an answer to Batter Skull right now. Okay, yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, he does have the Balfour Strix, which do have Death Touch, which could like trade, but it, you know, I, yeah. I, so, so Ari drew a spell pierce that turned no help. I mean, Mike drew a spell pierce. Ari okay. is continuing his attack. He now has Mike down to seven. That sort of Mika's is on one of the Baleful yep. Strixes. All right, and there's the Mirror Signet. Yeah, just more lands. Yeah, I mean, this is looking pretty good for Ari, I would say. A There's counter a counter spell. spell. Not going to really help Mike here. Right, I believe that, yeah, it goes to three. Up to three. Maybe it's getting to take out a piece of equipment is what it's looking at. I'm, or yeah, I mean, Planeswalker. Like, he's probably just going to keep the Ratchet Bomb in play until he really has to blow it, knowing Ari. Right. And, it, you know, it just seems like the right play here. Yeah, Mike is down to four. And now we see Swords to Plowshares from him. That yeah. will buy him a little bit of time. Swords will help a little bit. That is true. And he'll, he'll, he'll probably just pass the turn and, and just do it during combat. That would make the most sense. Right, because that way the Rari cannot re-equip the sword. Exactly. So That will add another turn onto Mike's clock. Yep, that is true. And, and with Mike having Counterspell backup, he could stop something else as well. All right, so we're going to see that Force of Will on the two-power Baleful Strix. Ari will go to 18. Mike will just take one, go to three. Yeah, there's a Source to Plowshare. And Ari has drawn Nile Spellbomb. Okay, so he, he's doing some counting here. Yep. He also has a Force of Will, but it looks like he can just hard cast now. Yeah, he could. All right, there's that Spell Bomb. Yeah, it looks like he just wants to leave up fo the, that Force mana. Yeah. That, I'm pretty sure Mike knows that, that Ari does have a Force in hand. So Mike will draw for the turn. Yeah, well, it's it's a little evident Ari didn't re-equip the Sword of the Meek. Yeah, know, exactly. That, that's suspicious. And he counted before he played Spell Bomb, and I think Ari <laughs> probably told me a Force of Will. Uh, All so. Right. There you have it. They are going to a game three. Ari versus Mike. Uh, Ari on blue black Tezzeret. Mike playing blue white stone blade. Mike will be on the play here. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll see if that matters at all or, or how much it matters, I should say. Yeah. So walk me through the reasoning behind, you know, our, behind some of Ari's plays there. Because at first glance, it seems a little counterintuitive that both his planeswalkers got pitched to force of wills. Well, essentially, I think Ari thought that he would just win with the Balfour Strixes, which he did. 
and I guess he thought that the Ratchet Bomb would be too slow because he would be too concerned about him resolving that Vidalion Click and then equipping it to the, uh, the Sword because the Sword gives it pro green and pro black and those Balfastrixes are black. So he would be taking five, he would have to discard a card anyway, Mike would get more mana, so Ari just figured, hey, let me just force all this Vidalion Click and just try to win with my, my uh, Balfastrixes. Okay, so he couldn't let a sword get attached to a creature. Exactly. If Ratchet Bomb, say, had two counters instead of zero or, or whatnot, had a couple more counters already, Ari could have let it resolve, and he would be able to two-for-one Mike there. Okay. Yeah. So uh, they are going to game three. Both players are two and one. And in a tournament like this with nine rounds, is, it's, it's really difficult because if you pick up a, a loss early, your back is pretty much against the wall. Yeah, and it can be really dangerous, especially in Legacy, where I think matchups are more skew than they are in other formats. You know, for example, Legacy has some 80-20 matchups in it, where it's really hard to find those in Standard. It can, you sometimes, sometimes even with a great deck, you can pick up a loss early. Sure, but that also comes down to what deck you choose, for example. If you choose a, a deck like Grixis Delver or Rug Delver, you're not really gonna have any, you know, 20% right. matchups. Most of your matchups are gonna be around 50%. If you pick up a deck, say, uh, you know, like Dredge or maybe like One Land Belcher. Or just like Goblins, you know. Or you, Goblins. You, you could play against a Belcher player around one, you know, and that, that's gonna be really hard for you. Sure, sure, that's definitely true. So it, it really comes down to your deck choice, I would say. Yeah, if you want to eliminate the skew matchups, you can pick a deck that, yeah, generally if you play, yeah. bl I would say if you play blue, you can avoid having a lot of those sure, matchups. Sure. And a deck in Legacy that really died down a lot uh, is, uh, is Zoo. Zoo used to be pretty popular. Right. And then all of a sudden, just Zoo was just nothing. Now, sometimes people attribute that to Stoneforge Mystic, right? Sure. I mean, Zoo still has a lot of good cards. It's still a very fast deck. Uh, just no one really plays it anymore. Yeah. Oh, well, so, so if not Stoneforge Mystic, why, did you, why would you say Zoo fell out of popularity? I mean, Stoneforge Mystic has something to do with it. Uh, just uh, the... Um, just a lot of new decks, something like uh, Sneak and Show, for example. Uh, just the combo decks. Because with Zoo, it is a very aggressive deck, but lots of times you'd have to dedicate uh, some main deck uh, slots or a lot of sideboard slots to like the hate bears that you have, um, like Gaddic Teague or, or, or Thalia or Aethersworn Cannonist or whatnot, you know? Right. So. So is Maverick just a better zoo then? Or? Yeah, I mean, Maverick's another deck that a lot of people aren't playing anymore. Maverick really died down. Junk died down. I think Death and Taxes kind of took the role of Maverick. Yeah, I know that we sent, we saw Maverick rise in popularity. It was kind of a response to Stoneblade becoming popular. They seem yeah. to go hand in hand. Yeah, exactly. Stoneblade, uh, Storm is becoming, uh, you know, more and more popular. Uh, sometimes Storm is very popular. Sometimes it's not very popular. It really goes in and out. Uh, even something like a Team America. Team America used to be super popular. Team America was a, uh, a bug deck with yeah. Tarmogoyf, with Dark Confidant. Uh, you, sometimes Deathrite it plays. Shaman, right? Uh, yeah, uh, it played uh, Tombstalker, Jace, Hemp to Turok. You know, there, there was a couple of different versions of it, uh, yeah. but that, that really died down, too. Its mantle's been, I would say, like, a lot of the Team America players have gone over to Shardless Bug. Yeah, Shardless Bug. I mean, the, the, the main reason why Legacy is so good is that, uh, you can just come to a Legacy tournament, you can have a lot of fun, you can play any deck that you want to play, and that deck is most likely going to be a competitive deck. You know, you have a lot of the good cards. You have, you know, a good sideboard strategy. Um, and it doesn't even come up to, uh, to matchups too often. It more comes down to maybe how well do you know your deck. So uh, I think Legacy is a great format. And even though there's powerful cards and there's powerful interactions, and sure, sometimes your opponent might go turn one, show and tell my Emrakul into play, you get a lot of gameplay in Legacy, and there's a lot of tough decisions. Yeah, so I would definitely say that that is the case. Uh, so again, this is round four, so we're we're almost halfway there. Oh, playing blue eyes stone blade. Uh, so who do you think should win this uh, game right here? It's you know, game three. Mike's on the play. Is he gonna take it down, or is Ari gonna take it down? I like Mike's odds here. I. Uh, it seems like a lot of the control things that Ari does aren't very well situated against the stone blade deck. Uh, we did see him, like I said, break through that chalice for one game one, and. I, yeah, so I, I do think I like Mike in this situation, especially, I mean, he's also on the play, which is pretty important. Yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. Maybe you could get, like, a really early Stoneforge Mystic, just yeah. turn to Stoneforge Mystic. If he has something like a, you know, Forcible Backup, he does have access to Spell Pierce, probably bringing in a couple of Swan Songs, definitely bringing in those Detention Spheres. Yeah, I mean, it's just that Counter Magic seems really good against the Tezzeret deck. All right, it looks like that might be a, I see rest, a rest in, in peace. peace All right, so that means he's definitely bringing in those Helm of Obediences as well, and he's going to try to win that way. Uh, both players are mulliganing, so uh, we'll, uh, 
we'll, we'll see how this plays out. All right, let me throw the same question over to you. How do you feel about the matchup here? Uh, I think the blue-white Stoneblade uh, deck is definitely favored. Uh, I'm honestly not that big of a fan of the blue-black Tezzeret deck. It's, it's definitely a cool deck. You know, we saw Reed Duke play a quote-unquote cool deck with Pox. Uh, here we're seeing Ari Lax play on a cool deck with Blue Black Tezzeret. And I think that's what really Legacy comes down uh, to. Like I was saying before, you can play almost any deck you want to play. So if you're going to have the most fun playing Blue Black Tezzeret, or if you're going to have the most fun playing Pox, why not play those decks? Yeah, you certainly in Legacy can find a deck that fits whatever style of play you want to play, which is, which is really nice in the format. Yeah, that's definitely true. You know, for me, I, I'm a big Delver-type player. Uh, I also really like Hemp to Torok. I it's love like, this card in general. It's like, so I'd say, like, so Delver's, like, that's tempo aggro, right? Yeah, yeah, kind of tempo aggro. Um, it's sometimes going to be tempo control. But uh, just, like, tempo decks in general are, are my kind of style. And I think for Ari, Ari likes decks that really, you know, mesh well together. Uh, he did very well by winning the, um, the Legacy Champs a couple weeks ago with Death and Taxes. He also mm -hmm. plays Storm a lot, another deck that really meshes well together. You need all the combo pieces. And in Blue Black Tezzeret, you know, he needs his Tezzeret, he needs his artifacts, and needs some disruption. Uh, right. so, so Mike's hands look very good here. Got Both players are going to keep on six. So we see Mike leading off on Fetchland, Ari with a Fetchland of his own. And once again, both players are just developing their mana bases at the beginning of the game. We see Counter Magic in the hands of both players. Well, I, I believe Mike is just going to go for the Stoneforge Mystic right here. Yep. Um, I believe Mike's hand is Jace the Mind Sculptor, Detention Sphere, a couple of lands. And was that blue card a Brainstorm, I think? Yeah, so he has a Brainstorm, a Jace, and a Force, and a Mystic. Oh, he, he also has a Force? Maybe a, no. No, sorry, it's just he a doesn't. Brainstorm. He yeah, it's just a, a Brainstorm, yeah. So, so, so no Counter Magic there. Yeah. Ari does have Counter Magic, and he's going to uh, Force Roll Pitch into Bell for Strix. Immediately forces the Stoneforge Mystic. Yeah. This is actually really good for Mike, since both players mulliganed. You know, Ari yeah, has two for one, Yeah, exactly. Right? Yep. It's basically like Mike just played a Hemp to Torok. <laughs> so uh, a white blue Hemp to Torok. Yeah, he tapped an island and a Tundra. All right. So can Ari present something? He's going to go ahead and take two more, go to 17, cracking fetch lands, and we'll see what his response is. Yeah. And I mean, if Mike could actually, re you know, resolve this Jace, it's going to be very, very good here. And, I, and there's a good chance if Ari plays something like a Chalice of the Void, which he is going to play, or even a, uh, a Signet, that might just actually de detention sphere right away. Yeah, and we'll see if he makes that play. The detention sphere will free up his brainstorm. He does have four lands now, so he's yeah. able to curve into that turn four Jace. Yeah, because Mike does have the brainstorm, I, I really can't see him not going detention sphere on that chalice right here. Well, does he need to do it now? I mean, it just kind of fits into his curve, right? He gets to go detention sphere, take a chalice of the void, next turn Jace, but I guess he doesn't want to do it. Yeah, I think he's. I think he. It's. It's all about the Jace right now. I think he just wants to establish advantage with sure. the Jace. Sure. Ari has no third land. He's going to play Talisman, and that will be his de facto third land. And this is going to open the window for Mike just to slam a Jace on an empty yeah. board. Uh, maybe Mike's thinking is, hey, if my Jace resolves, I can just shuffle away my brainstorm anyway. Yeah. So I can. He can. If, you if know? he has a Jace and multiple activations with the Jace, he can detention sphere the Chalice at his leisure. Yeah, and I guess he wants to de detention save the detention sphere for something you know more important. Yeah, say Ari, maybe if Ari plays a Tezzeret next turn. Sure, exactly. Or, or Ari's, uh, you know, um, I don't know, just, just anything else in general. All right, so we're going to see Crack of the Fetchland and it's almost certainly going to be Jace the Mind Sculptor. Yeah, he's probably just going to get another basic here. He doesn't really, or he could get a Thunder, he could get a basic. Either he's way, it's fine. He goes for a basic plane, so yeah, he has one of each basic. Yeah, yeah, I kind of like that. And uh, Jace is going to come down here, and I believe he's going to immediately just uh, brainstorm as yeah. long as it resolves. Yeah, Mike actually drew this turn a second Jace. Yeah, which, so. is, which is just phenomenal here. Yeah, it stops even if Ari has something like Tezzeret attack with Chalice of the Void. Uh, Mike, Mike will have another follow-up Jace for that. Yeah, another reason why I think the blue-white Stoneblade deck is favored is just because it has more threats. You know, like, Ari had to use his Force of Will on a Stoneforge Mystic. That was threat number one. Now Jace is threat number two. Mm -hmm. So far, everything Ari did was just not a threat. You know, Chalice is kind of a threat. Uh, Talisman uh, doesn't really do anything. And uh, there, there's a bunch of cards in Ari's deck that, you know, even something like a Snaring Bridge does nothing against the Jace. Yeah, Ari did draw City of Traders as his land for the turn. So he's going to start with the Talisman. And he's going to use the Talismans to cast a Ratchet Bomb. Yeah, Ratchet Bomb's going to be really slow. I think Ratchet Bomb in general is just a, a very slow guard. Absolutely. And, and here's the danger is that Mike has an uncontested Jace right now, and it, it only takes a couple of activations for, of that card to really pull away. Yeah, I believe Mike has one half of his combo. I believe he has a Helm of Obedience in his hand. Okay, and he's not even going to brainstorm the Jace's turn. He's 
contends enough with his hand that he's going to plus the Jace. That's kind of interesting. Maybe he knows the next card down. Um, and maybe the next card down is just a rest in peace. Yeah, he's got, he plays Helm. He does have a Ponder in his hand. Remember, he cannot cast that due yeah. to, well, he can cast it, but he can't resolve it. It, 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 it would just be countered. The, the only thing you, you can really cast with the Chal say the Chalice Voids on two, you can still abrupt decay it. Yeah, so Helm of Obedience, really in this deck, just used with the combo of rest in peace. The combo of rest in peace. Yeah. Exactly. The actual ability of it doesn't do too much. That will just, it mills the opponent's entire deck. Yeah, so, so Ari plays a bunch of artifacts here. Mike draws a Brainstorm. Now he's going to use J... Uh, yeah, I think he just hit Rest in Peace. And he, he has did. Force of Will. Well, I, that's, that's pretty strong. <laughs> is, is that a Rest in Peace? I believe there's a Rest in Peace in there. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, I think it's a foil Rest in Peace, and he has Force of Will backup, so... This should be game. Yeah, I think Ari only has two cards in his hand, so it, it's no combination that Ari could really get out of this, right? Not... Yeah, I can't think of one, so this should be good enough. Yeah, because even if he has blue card Force of Will, Mike will be able to force, force back. back. So we see Rest in Peace. And Ari kind of just said, yep, all right. Are you actually going to do it? Okay, okay. You're going to go uh, activate Helm. Ari's like, maybe he's Helm, not going to do it. Helm for two. Okay. So let's see. And all right, so Ari does That'll scoop it game. up right there. Awesome. All right, so we were right. Blue-White Stoneblade uh, takes it down. Mike defeats Ari Lax, you know, one of the uh, the more powerful magicians yeah, here today at SG really Providence. Good. So, uh, yeah, that's good. Mike's got to be feeling good. He just won on camera. Beat Ari. He played pretty well. Yeah, his deck, so this blue-white stone blade especially.